Hey, hey, I'm Keith, and today I'm gonna to show you how I built this modern outdoor or indoor bench out of Sapile mahogany. Now, my buddy Nick Key says you can put it in your shower. I guess Nick's shower is a little more palatial than mine. I'm gonna stick it out on the back patio instead. Here's how I built it. All right, first order of business, as usual, was to start breaking down material. Now, a lot of these parts look like doppelgangers of one another, so be sure to mark them accordingly so you don't get confused. And by you, I mean me, because I tend to get confused. Now, this was roughly 32 board feet of Sapili mahogany and about $6.50 a board foot. That tallies up to about $220 after tax. Once everything was rough cut on the miter saw, I could head to the table saw and start ripping down my parts. First, I was gonna work on the seat slats where I need 20 of those, but I cut a couple extra. And then my long seat stretchers, my end stretchers, my legs, and then over to the planer to make sure everything is down to the same thickness. Now I bought this as eight quarter stock, but it was S4S, so it was an inch and three quarter thick, and I needed to bring it all down to an inch and a half thick. Now it was time to start making the donuts. Figuratively speaking, of course, I could start batching out all my seat slats. I set up a stop block and cut them all to exactly 17 inches. And the last one, bloop. And because I'm as impatient as Jerry and Lola at dinner time, I needed to do a dry assembly just to see how everything was looking and scaling out proportion wise. Got the seat slats on, step back, little head scratch and yeah. That's good. So the way I designed this was the seat slats get notched out and sit on notches on the notch stretchers. So I needed a way to consistently make all of those notches so they were equally spaced and at the same depth. In order to do this, I had to make a nice big crosscut sled for my table saw. I first started with a piece of 5 8 Baltic birch plywood, glued that down onto two hardwood runners, and then glued and screwed a back fence onto the sled. Now this back fence is there strictly to hold the sled together when you make your first cut through. Then I could permanently screw in my runners. I used a little wax. Now you wanna make sure you countersink these screws. And then while it was flipped over, I waxed the entire bottom and the runners to make sure I had a nice slick surface. And then I could pre-drill my holes for my front fence. I made sure to countersink all those screws so that the screw heads do not drag on the surface of my table saw. So then I could flip that over and bring the fence in. Now this is a piece of sapili that I milled flat and square just for this purpose. Now I'm using a little CA glue in the middle just to tack it in place. So my thought process here was to secure the fence around the blade, make a cut through, check for square, and then adjust the outer ends of my fence from there. Now since my blade is perfectly 1 8 of an inch, I use an eighth inch setup block and then a square to check that that cut is square to the fence. And I got lucky and it was dead on. I think that's a product of having square material to start with. Then I could just clamp down the fence and secure it on both sides. I also added this little safety block on the front in case I went too far and the blade came through. I wouldn't be in danger of dadoing my thumbs. And after that glue was dry, chucked up my dado stack and glued on another safety block. Oh, wait for it. There it is, my favorite forearm cam. Thank you, cameraman. So now I have a zero clearance crosscut sled. I adjust the height to a half an inch. Then I can make a test cut to make sure that the depth is in fact one half of an inch. Survey says half an inch. We're good to go. Now I could take an actual slat, which is supposed to be an inch and a half, but you know, sometimes you get a little of that parallax error when reading a ruler, so it may be a hair off. So the only way to really test is use a piece, mark it, cut it, and check the fit. And it looks like mini me KJ approves. Now the spacing in between each slat is one inch. So on my test piece, I use a one, two, three block and make a mark at one inch. So if I move this over and line up my cut line with the edge of the blade, I can put my little stop block in here. So what that does is I make my first pass and then I slide it over where the inside edge of that it's the outside edge of the block, and that gives me the exact width I need. And then I just keep moving down. Each one gets two passes. 
And then with a little CA glue, I can secure that block in place. Activator. Now, since this little piece will basically be the backbone of all of our cuts, I secure it with a couple screws to make sure it doesn't move. And then a quick test cut. So ultimately this groove or dado needs to be an inch and a half wide to accommodate the inch and a half seat slats. So I have a three quarter inch block, which is half that distance. However, my dado stack is three quarters of an inch and I have a 16th of an inch additional blade in there. So as you can see, when I put this on the three quarter inch strip, there's a lot of play there. So I've made this little 16th of an inch shim that will prevent this from sliding over too much and making too big of a groove. Once that was all sorted out, I grabbed my seat slat stretchers, double-sided taped them together, so that way I could cut them at the same time and I know the grooves will be in the exact same position in both. Now, even though I confirmed with my test pieces that this would work, I needed to do the same setup on my final pieces to get that first cut set so then I could keep working on down the line. And please note that I made that first dado a little bit further in from the end, even though at the end I will trim that off. I wanted to leave myself a little extra on the ends. So after a test fit, that confirms everything is okay. So now I can start making my way down the line, two passes for each dado. Now after my first groove was cut, I made my first pass on my second, and then I took that shim that we discussed earlier and slid that in and then made a second pass on there. I hadn't affixed that shim yet because I wanted to make sure that the cuts were going to be consistent and it wasn't just fitting on the first one. With the fit confirmed, I could CA glue that shim to my stop block and we could fire up this dado train. But first, I got a little wise. Rather than using an F-style clamp to secure the workpiece to the fence and clamping and unclamping every time I moved it down, I installed these Bessie hold-down clamps, which work perfectly. And also, if there's any kind of bow in your board, it secures them down perfectly flat on the sled. Because if you're not flat down on the sled, you will end up with cuts that are inconsistent in depth. Now, if you happen to buy plans to build one of these benches of your own, you don't necessarily need a dado stack to do this. You can do it with a single blade and just keep making pass after pass, or you can set up some kind of router jig to do the same thing. And as you can see, I cut a little close on the end there. I wanted to leave a little extra material to cut off, but a little bit over is better than a little bit under. And there are 20 equally sized and spaced dados. Well, 40 really, because there's two pieces. Then I could trim off the waist at the end, check that, make sure it's flush, and crack them open like a couple of frozen hamburgers. Now it was onto the dados for the seat slats. As you can see, they're inch and a half wide, and they start an inch and a half in from each end. If I make my cuts and butt it up against that, it's exactly an inch and a half in. So with that inch and a half spacing set, I go ahead and make the cuts on all of my slats on both sides. Then I can adjust my stop block and make all of my second pass cuts on each piece. So once those were done, I had to remove my precious walnut stop block and I replaced it with a J-Cats Moses stop block that has a micro adjust so I could dial in the fit. And as you can see, I had to make a minor tweak. Just move that micro adjust over, take a quick shave, double check it. That one's a little bit tight, but I'm okay with that. And then I proceed in doing the second pass on both sides on my entire stack of seat slats. That is some serious alliteration. Next on the to-do list was to cut the dados on the end stretchers. This, I'm dialing up the depth to three quarters of an inch. So it's a lot of material to hog out in one pass, so you just gotta take it slow. And these cuts, I'm just centering on the end slats. I'll, I'll come back and cut the groove in the bottom support stretcher after I put the leg assembly together. And it looks like I was chomping at the bit because it's on to the leg assembly we go. I will be assembling these with dominoes. So I do the end stretchers first and then cut the mating slots in the legs. And I can do a little assembly here. Hey, look at that. Just what I always wanted. A pair of H's. No time to dawdle. Chip, chop, chip. It's on to cutting the mortises in the top of the legs that will meet the top notched stretcher. So after I cut the four in the leg, I lay out my lines on my top notched stretcher. Jerry. What's up, big guy? Successful nap? Alrighty then. So with those marked out, I could cut my mating slots in my notched stretcher and then do a nice little dry assembly to get a look at this thing. 
I put a seat slot on each end in the middle just to lock everything together. And then I make sure I check for square in all corners. That all looks good. So then I put my stretcher down and mark out exactly where that groove is going to go. You can go by dimensions on the drawing, but it's just better to double check it rather than cut everything ahead of time and go to put it together and find out it's a little bit off. So I make my first pass and then mark it for my second pass. And then return to the bench for a test fit. Now I also left this a little long on each end so I could trim those off. I highly advise that. Now let's see what Lola's up to. Oh my goodness. Sleepyhead Lola. All right, cuteness overload, back to work. And now it was on to the glue up. For this, I'm using Total Boat Fixo, the fast cure. So this is flexible epoxy, and man do I love this stuff. You get 20 to 30 minutes open time, it's thick so it's not running all over the place, it's a delight. It's also sandable and pretty much cured in about four hours. And even though this piece is going outdoors, I am using the standard Beach Dominoes. Festool does make mahogany ones. These things are gonna be so slathered in epoxy, they're never gonna see the light of day. I'm totally fine on this small project for just using the standard Dominoes. Now to attach the bottom stretcher to the end stretchers, I'm using the epoxy, but I'm also popping in a couple of stainless steel screws. These will be hidden underneath, never to be seen by the human eye. And while that dries, I could take time to sand all of the seat slats, get them all flipped over and rerouted and rounded around and moved around, zippity dip dip, and route all the edges. And when I say all the edges, I mean all the edges with an eighth of an inch round over bit, Zip, zip, zip. Finally done. Line them up and rest that battery. Oh, hey, did you know that I'm on a podcast called the Shop Sounds Podcast? It includes myself, Jason from Bourbon Moth Woodworking, and Nick Key from Key Woodworks. We're a woodworking podcast about nothing. So check the link below to tune in and subscribe. And it's not really about nothing. I mean, even nothing is something. And with my leg sub-assemblies cured, I could pull those out of the clamps, get everything sanded nice and flush there. And what, oh my gosh, holy cats! Ladies and gentlemen, this is a world exclusive shop cat Jerry seen jumping and ascending into his perch. Amazing. All right, excitement over. Now I could round over all the edges on those leg assemblies and zip my way down that knot stretcher as well and start glue up of the end stretchers and the leg assemblies. Back to the thick sew, of course, some dominoes. Then the old trusty hammer fist, of course. Grab a couple of clamps, pull those tight. Now I'm putting in a couple of those seat slats just to lock everything into position like I did on the dry fit. And then it was hammer time. Now, since I'm using interlocking dados and epoxy to glue everything together, screws aren't really necessary. However, rather than clamping each individual piece or running a call down the whole length of it, I figured I could just run some three inch stainless steel screws from below, glue it, and no clamping necessary. So stage one was to glue and screw the end slats in the middle slat. That way it would lock everything into position, let that dry for a little bit, and then come back and screw in all my remaining slats. So with the glue dry enough, I could release it from the clamps, unturtle it off its back, and start laying in each individual slats and prepping them for pre-drilling. Man, I wish I had the Benny Hill music for this clip. So now it has to be re-turtled onto its back and I could start pre-drilling. Now, unfortunately that drill bit didn't go far enough, so I had to finish the pre-drill and while I was watching a little TV, Lola stopped in for a visit. Then it was thick-so time. So I just started applying epoxy on all my little dados and working my way down. Right to the last one. And then I could rotisserie this Sapili chicken back over. And then I could send all those three inch stainless steel screws home. I'm using a little bit of paste wax for some lubrication. Can't afford to bust off any screw heads at this juncture. And then I could flip this thing over. Boy, that thing got a little heavy. And since two of the slats sat right over the leg where I could not get a screw, I'm just clamping those. And you can see it's nice and flat and level. A few hours later, I could remove the clamps, which basically gave us a bench on a bench. 
Then it was time for some more epoxy. Total boat high performance epoxy. What for? Well, I gotta seal the end grain on those legs. Since these will sit on the ground outside, I wanna make sure no moisture can be absorbed up through that end grain. Then I could sand out any imperfections on the top and give it a test run. Hmm, bad. A little beverage. Oops, missed a spot. Got it. Now we could move on to the top coat. I'm gonna use Total Boat Halcyon Clear Gloss. Now I'm gonna do three coats in gloss and then two coats in satin. Now the reason you do gloss first is because it is more clear. The satin has matting agents which make it a little bit milky. So if you were to start with satin the whole way through, it would just get progressively cloudier. So if you start with a clear finish and then coat it with the satin, it gives you a much better looking finish and lets more of that wood grain come through. Now I'm using the Fuji Q5 Platinum HVLP sprayer with a 1.3 millimeter tip. Now this Halcyon does not need to be thinned. It's ready to go right out of the bag after you strain it. But if your HVLP isn't strong enough, you can thin it by up to 20% with water. And if you don't have an HVLP, it can also be brushed or rolled. Now we're on to the satin coat so I could strain that and head back outside. Now I gave each coat about an hour or two to dry. So I did all of this in one day, five coats. And the great thing about this product, it allows for rapid recoating in an hour and doesn't require sanding between coats if you recoat within 12 hours. That's right, folks. No sanding between coats. Write that down. And with that, this bench was done. And if you'd like to build a bench like this of your own, plans are available. Check the link in the description below. And be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to keep up with all my future projects. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.